This program is brought to you by Emory University. Hello, and thank you for joining us for part two of the forum to increase evidence-based practices by addressing disparities in the system. Today, we are again focusing on reducing disproportionate minority contact in the juvenile justice system. Today, you'll hear information from experts in the field about the school to prison pipeline, the current juvenile justice reform going on in Georgia, and some evidence-based practices you can use to reduce disproportionate minority contact in your community. Following this presentation, if you have any questions, please feel free to give me or send me an email at samantha.wolf, W-O-L-F, at children.ga.gov. Thank you. I'm Joe Vignati with the Governor's Office for Children and Families. Lately, there has been a lot of talk about how addressing Georgia's criminal justice system more responsibly can address some problems facing our state. For example, we know that communities with high unemployment, underachieving schools, and a lack of other resources have high rates of crime. This problem particularly hurts children and young adults who may end up in the system. If we take a common sense approach to solving our community's problems, we can decrease crime and enhance public safety. On the other hand, if we spend resources sending more people to prison instead of using proven alternatives, these problems will remain. Specifically, we need to identify practical things we can do to address these and other issues. By providing funding to local communities for programs shown to work, Georgia is moving towards a more targeted use of public resources through the investment in outcomes. This responsible approach to criminal justice and juvenile justice will make our state safer and help all Georgians. Juvenile reform is the responsible management of Georgia's resources. Before we get into our DMC discussion, I think it's important to give you some context as to who we are and what we do. I work for the Governor's Office for Children and Families uh, under the able and capable leadership of our Executive Director, Ms. Katie Jo Ballard. And our mission is to reach, support, and empower communities to serve Georgia's children and families. We're organized into four different divisions, and we provide state and federal funding for child welfare and juvenile justice systems. Our motto is family. Families are children's greatest resource, and children are our greatest resource. The Justice Division, which is the division that I work in, uh, we have an organizing belief. Juvenile justice research, state and federal law, and best practice all support the premise that youth are fundamentally different than adults in both their level of responsibility as well as their potential for rehabilitation. Children are not adults. We have a separate system in our state. Our juvenile justice system is distinct from the adult system and provides procedures, as you've heard already, that are unique to the treatment of juveniles. There are three things that the Justice Division does in the Governor's Office for Children and Families. We provide direct funding to local communities to prevent or intervene in, juvenile, in the juvenile justice system. We provide and disseminate research to interested parties in the state, and we provide technical assistance. Additionally, we're responsible for developing Georgia's state plan for juvenile justice. As we are a recipient of federal juvenile justice funds, we have to develop a comprehensive three-year plan every three years. Our current plan runs from January 1st of 2012 through the 31st of 2014. Our current plan identified two specific areas, a two-pronged approach for dealing with juvenile justice issues in our state. 
This is how we aim to positively impact Georgia's juvenile justice system. The first of these areas is diversion. This is to prevent juveniles from entering the system, but also diversion means preventing the further penetration of juveniles into our system. Second funding area, and for purposes of our funding, aftercare reentry is defined as providing for the successful return of incarcerated juveniles to their communities. Reentry is an area that we anticipate there will be more work in 2014 on, and the Criminal Justice Reform Council will take this charge up, and there will be recommendations that we will all hear about in the coming year. In addition to the juvenile justice grants that my office administers, we also are part of the Juvenile Reinvestment Grant Program under the Juvenile Reform. HB 242, the new Children's Code, uh, has focused evidence-based interventions that have been shown to be effective with a juvenile population. Research has shown that the programs listed are effective interventions with this population. MST, multi-systemic therapy, FFT, functional family therapy, thinking for a change, ART, aggression replacement training, and seven challenges are all evidence-based programs, interventions that have been shown to be effective. Uh, and we are moving Georgia to community funding for these specific interventions. In 2013, we received 35 applications representing 61 counties requesting $10.4 million in grant funds. Uh, this resulted, unfortunately, we only had about $6 million, uh, so we were able to award 29 local awards that touched 61, I'm sorry, 49 counties, totaling $5.6 million. These 49 counties represent almost 70% of Georgia's at-risk population. So in our first year, we have targeted funding for counties that contain almost 70% of Georgia's at-risk population. The map here uh, that will show you the first year targeted counties, uh, the counties that are in red are direct grant recipients from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and the counties in blue are counties that receive grants from the Governor's Office for Children and Families. We're specifically targeting reductions in felony commitments to the Department of Juvenile Justice and admissions to the short-term program. Counties must target evidence-based interventions to youth and reduce these by at least 20% in order to qualify for funding. So how does this translate into our efforts with DMC to impact disproportionate minority contact? In fiscal year 2012, 66% of the youth in the state that received a felony commitment to DJJ or were admitted to a short-term program were African-American youth, which is far exceeding their percentage in the population. So if we don't widen our net, if we use these targeted interventions and continue to focus on community-based services, we are directing our grant efforts, which will directly impact DMC in our state. You heard me talk about DMC and other presenters talk about DMC. Uh, one of the areas of responsibility for our office is to examine disproportionate minority contact in the juvenile justice system and to develop interventions to address that. Unfortunately, dis disparity exists in our juvenile justice system like other, many other states. Determining the causes of that disparity is more difficult. Uh, in addition to looking at DMC, we have a DMC subcommittee of juvenile court practitioners, and you've heard from several juvenile court judges and other presenters that are on our DMC subcommittee that meet at least quarterly to explore ways to address the issue. Uh, more recently, we hosted a statewide DMC forum, and we're going to take that forum on the road next year as well. A 
Back in 2012, we commissioned a statewide DMC study uh, with the Carl Vinson Institute of Government. There's a copy that can be found on our website, and the address is listed here. Uh, the findings were that mobility effects and differential offending are contributing causes to DMC in Georgia. Mobility effects, what, what, what does that mean? Uh, a mobility effect is a circumstance where juveniles commit offenses outside their home jurisdiction, sometimes inflating the rates of disparity. Differential offending is a complex series of factors, such as poverty, single parent homes, that leads to disproportionate shares of racial and ethnic minorities engaging in delinquent acts, which helps explain DMC in our juvenile system. The stresses of poverty is a clear influence on DMC. And according to the statewide DMC assessment, the pattern of youth referrals to juvenile courts is clear. Areas with schools with both higher African-American youth enrollment and free and reduced lunch enrollment see higher referral rates for African-American youth. Conversely, areas with high African-American youth but low free and reduced lunch enrollment do not show these high referral rates. Of course, improved data collection will help us get a better sense of what causes DMC in our state. The statewide DMC assessment also made a number of recommendations, and you can look at the full 35-page uh, report on our website, but let me give you a summation here. Uh, programs directed at crimes have been found to have differential offending patterns might be advantageous in helping youth. So direct service programs, uh, and that's what the, these grants that we're talking about, the GOCF Juvenile Justice Grants and the Juvenile Reinvestment Grants that both our office and the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council are administering are the exact types of direct service programming that might help build skills, improve social functioning, and help form healthy relationships in the home and help intervene in our communities. Uh, this might help lower disparity in our communities. Number two, data review. Uh, it's been shown that if we're able to map the data points across the juvenile justice system, uh, we may be able to determine where we can make interventions specifically in the system. And we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, some of the other information around this is that the availability of adequate data to provide an analysis is lacking right now in our state. Uh, implementing a policy of more complete and harmonized data collection across our systems would greatly improve our ability to conduct a DMC analysis. And then finally, uh, it's, in, 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 it's important for us to continue to collect good data so we have an understanding of what what's occurring in our juvenile justice system. Uh, and uh, specifically, if we're able to map locations and zip codes with offenses and referrals, uh, we'll be able to have a better understanding of where we need to target youth and provide services. We have a juvenile data site that's open to the public, uh, which contains a wealth of information uh, and this is one of the responsibilities of our office under federal and state code. Uh, and one can never overemphasize the importance of good data. And let's look at the DMC data for Georgia in our most recent year that's available, calendar year 2011. As we talked about a couple of minutes ago, uh, it's important to look at various stages along the decision-making points in the juvenile justice system, and we have good data along these six points in the juvenile justice system for the state. Uh, this is a DMC dashboard, uh, and for the purposes of the slides, let, let me just tell you what you're seeing. Uh, in green, that is the proportion of juveniles in our state that are African-American youth. In orange, that is the proportion of white youth. 
In blue, that is the proportion of Hispanic youth, purple, Asian youth, and yellow, it's other or mixed race youth. We would expect to see a similar percentage in population at each step in the system. So for example, if we have 35% African American youth in our population at risk, that's 35% of Georgia's youth, we would expect to see roughly 35% along each stage in the system. 35% referrals, 35% detentions, commitments, confinements to a YDC, and transfers to the adult court. Now, as you go through the system and look at 2011's data, we see that African American youth, 35% of the population, represent 58% of the referrals to our juvenile courts. 66% of our African American youth are detained, 70% are committed to DJJ. Uh, confinement, 66%, and transfers to the adult criminal court are 76%. So we have data available for the state and for every county from years 2005 through 2011, which allows us to look and see the disparity exists, but it doesn't necessarily indicate why this disparity exists. That's the reason why we had a statewide DMC assessment to help us parse out what are the reasons for this. Uh, we're about to add 2012 data uh, in the next few weeks and we'll update the website accordingly. And as we said before, the challenge of securing good data, more enhanced data, will help us be more confident in the causes of DMC. And finally, our new charge, the new Children's Code, and it's been referenced in my presentation and other presentations that you've heard, uh, in keeping with the new provisions, the intent of this funding and, and the intent of our new code is to preserve and strengthen family relationships in order to allow each child to live in safety and security. Important. The guiding principle of our juvenile justice system in Georgia as of January 1, 2014 has changed and it's to preserve and strengthen family relationships in order to allow each child to live in safety and security. We thank you for listening to the messages today. And if you have any questions or if we can provide you with information, technical assistance about the work that we do, our contact information is listed in the slides. And thank you for your support of juvenile reform in Georgia. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our discussion of the school to prison pipeline, uh, which I have titled, When Did Making Adults Mad Become a Crime? And I want to discuss a, a collaborative approach to reducing school arrests and improving outcomes. Uh, before I continue, though, I want to lay a foundation as to the importance of the school to prison pipeline as it relates to disproportionate minority contact and racial and ethnic disparities. And let me do that by sharing with you uh, one particular study um, that uh, you can find in a couple of my publications um, that report that as mu many as um, uh, six times for African Americans and uh, three times um, for uh, Hispanics um, are suspended, expelled, and arrested um, out of school uh, compared to their white counterparts. And we're talking about um, for similar transactions on the first offense. Uh, so just by that uh, number alone, uh, we can I think surmise how important it is that we address uh, how we go about suspending, expelling, and arresting kids on school campus. So with that, I think it's also important to lay this foundation because for many, when you talk about reducing school arrests, uh, there is this sense of a soft approach to juvenile crime. Uh, there are, are many who still uh, want to take a, a, a tough 
on crime uh, approach and believe that the deterrence theory uh, still plays a significant role that if we if we show the kids in school that they don't they they uh, should not misbehave by arresting them suspending them expelling them uh, then they'll get the message uh, however let me let me show you this is Clayton County um, and when we started our reform locally in, in, in Clayton County in two, uh, I say 2003, but you know we started working building that foundation around uh, starting in 2001. But by 2003, we were able to put a lot of things in place. One of the biggest things we put in place is our school uh, referral reduction program, which is this collaborative approach I'm going to talk about. But notice what you see here is a graph. Uh, of complaints and petitions filed in Clayton County uh, going back uh, to 1999. Now, in Georgia, this is very important that you know that complaints are required by law. When filed, they must be accepted by the court. Uh, I do not have discretion uh, to say no to complaints. I do have the discretion as a juvenile court judge uh, to decide what to do with the complaint once it's filed. In other words, is it going to be diverted and formally adjusted, or do I send it to the district attorney, let them decide whether or not there is sufficient evidence to prosecute the case? You're always going to find a lower rate of petitions uh, than complaints for, for that reason. Uh, so let's focus on the blue line, the complaints. Uh, what you see here since we began our best practices or our reform in Clayton County is nearly a 60 percent reduction in juvenile crime. Despite the fact, okay, that uh, it, the, the, the practices we put in place uh, give the appearance to some that uh, we were taking a softer approach. Let's break it down some more because some may ask the question, okay, fine, judge, but, you know, what type of crimes are we talking about? We are talking about a reduction in crimes in every category, drugs, persons, property, and weapons. And, and in fact, in those categories, um, we... Uh, experience at least a 43 percent reduction uh, in those complaints. Um, what brings it up to nearly 60 percent uh, is, and you don't see it here, but there, there's been a 76 percent reduction in public uh, order uh, offenses. Uh, so I like to tell folks, please don't let appearances mislead you. Um, when you look at these type of practices I'm going to share with you, um, which I need to connect up uh, to a later discussion that will uh, be presented uh, in these modules, and that is uh, our, our House Bill 242 and the juvenile justice reform. Again, some may say, well, these reforms look like they're soft on, on crime, when in fact they're not. They're smart on juvenile crime. And so, for example, in Clayton County, since 2003, we have experienced a 70 percent decrease in our average daily population in the uh, regional youth uh, detention center. Uh, this is a 12.4 average daily population that is in a 60-bed holding facility. Uh, so, for example, when I took the bench in 1999, we had over 100 kids, Clayton County kids, in the RYDC. And uh, sadly, we had them on mattresses on the floor. But yet today, we, we have a 12.4 average daily population, a 43% reduction in the average length of stay, a 64% reduction in the average daily population of minority youth, 43% reduction in commitments to the state, and a 40% reduction in commitments of minority youth. Yet, despite that decline, despite that appearance that it looks like we are soft on crime because we are not locking up as many kids, we have a 60% reduction in juvenile arrest and a 24% increase in overall graduation rates. I like to say, so goes graduation rates, so goes juvenile crime. Okay? So that's why I want to now come full circle back to suspensions, expulsions, and arrest on school campus. The problem, zero tolerance policies. How does this all work? The courts, the schools, the police, uh, and kids. 
The impact of zero tolerance on school campus we see in many instances uh, occurred uh, in the 1990s, the early 1990s. Um, and, and for us in Clayton County, you can see by this graph that we had over 2,000 percent increase in juvenile arrests after we place police on campus. Now, first of all, I am not making a policy statement that, uh, that police have no business on campus. I stay away from that as a judge. I let policymakers get into that. However, I do make a statement that for any locality that makes the policy decision to put police on campus, be careful how you do it. And I'm going to be talking about that in just a moment. But nonetheless, 92% of the kids you see in this significant increase, this red line, were kids arrested on misdemeanor offenses, mostly disrupting public school, disorderly conduct, school fights. Um, and, and, and so it begs the question, okay, if 92% of these kids were arrested on such low-level offenses, all right, um, why, um, you know, or how are we really effectively using police on campus when these type of offenses tend to be those things that we call typical juvenile type of behavior? Now, we have to be careful. When we start treating kids who misbehave and it's connected to this typical juvenile behavior, we run the risk of what I call hyper-recidivism. That is when an individual or system responds to an offender using a technique that exacerbates the risk to reoffend. Because we know from research, it, it, there's no doubt that, you know, if you take a low-risk kid and you treat them in a harsh way as if they are a delinquent youth, then you will increase their risk of, rec of recidivating of coming back again, but getting worse. They may come back yet in a worse way, in a more serious offense. So what was the solution for us in Clayton County? And, and this is what inspired us, okay? And that is the Annie E. Casey Foundation uh, Detention Alternatives Initiative. Uh, we became a uh, participating site in 2003. And then the National Council of Juvenile and Family Court Judges New Delinquency Guidelines. They were new at the time, but there are 16 key principles. Uh, in this um, solution that I call it, or uh, these uh, entities that inspired us, um, you know, we learned the research about the, the harshness and the negative impact on kids when we uh, over-arrest and we over-suspend and we over-expel. And one of the key principles that the Annie Casey Foundation in their core strategies and in the 16 principles of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges is the role of the judge. Because I believe that, you know, understanding the role of the judge is to understand the nature of our juvenile justice systems. Let me point this out. Look at this slide. On the left side, you have and I've, I've collapsed some of these, but there are eight criminogenic factors, or what we call crime-producing needs, or to make it juvenile terminology, focus, delinquency-producing needs. Uh, cognition, uh, the way we think, uh, our attitudes, values, and beliefs, our peers, who we associate with. Notice, school connectedness, okay? Uh, family function substance abuse and weak problem solving skills. But the significance of this graph is understanding the juvenile justice system and why collaboration is very important. Because when you take those things on the left side for which we seek to identify in kids who are delinquent um, and we want to address those things because in doing that we will reduce their risk of delinquency we must match them up to best practices that address those specific needs. Well, to do that depends upon who provides those services in the community. And we find that as we connect them up, and I, I, this is just a general graph, that there's much more specificity to this, but 
we find these best practices in different agencies, social services, mental health, um, you know, private providers who do cognitive restructuring, the school system itself, uh, multi, uh, those who do multi-systemic therapy or functional family therapy, and the probation in the courts. The bottom line is that is that the juvenile justice system is not a single entity. It is not the juvenile court. It is not the Department of Juvenile Justice of our state. It is the entire community. It is everybody. But the effectiveness of that juvenile justice system is going to be dependent upon all of these agencies who provide services to children talking, working together, and developing in their community a multi-integrated system that works like I have described here. Um, so if you take education, law enforcement, mental health, social services, and typically in a systems theory, when you look at one system, you have inputs and outputs. But in a juvenile justice system, for it to be effective, we need to bring all these different child service agencies, reconfigure them, so that as their inputs are going in, okay, that the outputs, which the desired outcome is we want, is to reduce recidivism or to prevent even delinquency in the first place, is that they're all working together so that they are working toward that one single desired outcome, those things I've just, I've just mentioned. The question is, how do you make that happen? Okay, That's the fundamental question. And that's about collaboration. But you know, we give a lot of talk toward collaboration. And, and a lot of people walk away, and understandably so, with this, oh, this is just a kumbaya, you know, theory. You know, there really is some art and science to, to uh, collaboration. And I think one of the reasons why um, we have, uh, we treat collaboration that kumbaya way is that we don't fully understand the way that it should work. And because typically when we, when we look to collaborate, we tend to look at the organization, okay? In, in, in collaborating, and we, when we focus on that, um, we, we tend to be in a box. When we need to get outside that box, and, and so a, a, a model for collaboration should be uh, looking at the problem domain. We need to shift from the organization to the problem domain. What's the problem? You need to expand it. Well, if the problem here is the school to prison pipeline, over arrest, over suspension, over expulsion, that's the problem, then once you identify that's the problem and you focus on that, then, it, then, the, then that question is, well, then who's involved in this in terms of fixing it? Well, it's no longer just the school anymore, okay? It's going to be the courts, all right? It's going to be the police if you have police on campus or you're calling police to come on campus. So you, it helps you identify those sta stakeholders and bring them uh, together. So what we have here is that by a problem domain focus, as opposed to an organization focus analysis, tends to drive the evaluator to understanding that each stakeholder system sometimes works within a larger system with shared boundaries. Instead of asking how do we address disruptive students, which will lead to punitive measures given the shortfall of resources, the question becomes who else shares our problem and has resources to help us? Okay. So when, when we look at it that way, we have a different definition of collaboration. That is, collaboration occurs when a group of autonomous stakeholders of a problem domain, like the schools, the courts, the police, engage in an interactive process using shared rules, norms, and structures to act or decide on issues related to that domain. But that begs the, another question. How do you get the stakeholders together, these autonomous stakeholders, who are sharing this problem domain? Well, who convenes? You need somebody to convene. So you need to identify somebody who has that convening authority. The ability to bring stakeholders to the table, they have legitimacy. No one questions among the stakeholders that this convener has the authority, formal or informal, within the problem domain, that this convener has vision, understands the problem domain and related issues, the process, stakeholder concerns and needs, and they possess stakeholder knowledge. They know the stakeholders. They can identify with the stakeholders and possesses knowledge of each stakeholder role in the problem domain. And that brings me, I think, to the obvious answer, and that is the judicial leadership model. 
judges and their inherent authority or power to convene the stakeholders. Uh, I, I, I wrote uh, in a uh, article titled the, judicial, uh, the Dichotomy of Judicial Leadership, and it was an article specific to working with status offenders and improving outcomes for status offenders, that I make reference to this judicial leadership model. And that is that the juvenile court is the one place where all agencies serving children and youth intersect. Okay? When you look at those criminogenic factors, and you look at all the agencies that, can, that address any number of those criminogenic factors, what do you have? You have folks who come into a judge's courtroom on one child at one time. I mean, as a juvenile court judge with nearly 15 years on the bench, I, in my early days, had the unfortunate problem of having a kid in my court for which I've had a Department of Juvenile Justice present who's dealing with that kid, and I've had the Department of Family and Children's Services dealing with that kid, and the kid was in foster care, let's say, and now the kid committed a delinquent act for whatever reason, now a crossover youth, we have, I had defects pointing the DJJ saying, this kid is now your concern, not mine, okay? Um, so that means if the, that the juvenile court is the common denominator of all the child service agencies, when you really think about it. And so if that's the case, then with the juvenile court situated at the crossroads of juvenile justice, I say that the juvenile court judge is placed in a unique role as the traffic cop. Now, I want to emphasize one, one quote here uh, by a very well-known uh, Superior Court judge, now retired, Leonard Perry Edwards, who was awarded the Rehnquist Award for Judicial Excellence and a former president of the National Council of Juvenile Family Court Judges. And you know, he makes this point. He says, we have to get off the bench, the judges. He's talking to, to all of us out there. And we have to work in the community. We have to ask these agencies in the community to work together to support our efforts so that the orders that we make on the bench can be fulfilled, that we have to be the champions of collaboration. And I want to point a little footnote here. You know, when I do an order, I own it. DJJ doesn't own it. My probation officers don't own it, okay? No one else owns it. Parents don't own it. Prosecutor doesn't own it. Public defender doesn't own it. I own it. My name's on it. So it begs the question, when I put my name on that order, am I asking the questions like if it's detention, then what are the conditions of confinement I'm putting that kid in? Or when I put a special condition on there that this child has to participate in this program, am I asking the question if that program is effective and does it work? Because when I put my name on there, I own it, and it's my business to ask those questions. And that's what judicial leadership is about, and that's why judicial leadership is a key to the strategy of reducing school arrest. But I want to I caution. Um, in, for the last going on five years, I, I have a technical assistance team that, that travels this country. We have many, many sites now, most recently uh, Broward County, Florida, uh, that just signed a, a school reduction uh, uh, a protocol modeled after Clayton County. We were down there working with them the last year, Gainesville, Florida, but we've been from Middlesex County, Massachusetts, Wichita, Kansas. Uh, we're working with Los Angeles County, uh, Columbus, Ohio. Um, you know, Kenton County, Kentucky, Christian County, Kentucky, but you know, the sites go on and on, and, and it's like a snowball, it's getting bigger and bigger as it goes down the hill, this is picking up uh, steam. But the one thing that I've cautioned judges, be careful um, in this one sense, um, try to not avoid facilitating, but remain a convener so that you can participate in the process okay, and bring somebody in from the outside to facilitate uh, these stakeholder meetings. Remember, the problem informs. So when Clayton County began its stakeholder meetings, okay, it began with a single objective to reduce school arrest. After the interactive process, it became evident that the problem was bigger than school arrest, which led to understanding that the solution was multifaceted. For example, a convener must understand that the stakeholder's self-interest and the problem domain's collective interests are not always clear and distinct. This interactive process may present yet new questions, issues and interests that in turn may lead to identifying other stakeholders who should be at the table. 
So, for example, some questions that we experience in our interactive process, and by the way, back in 2003, it took us nine months to develop our protocol. Now, sites today, it's not taken as long because we were the first jurisdiction in the United States to develop such an agreement. So being the first, it took us longer, okay? But because we have this experience, we can share that experience with the sites we work with now, it doesn't take as long. But here's some questions we experience. And so we were able to help out these sites with, the, with these questions in advance, knowing that they would come up otherwise. What are school administrators to do with disruptive students who no longer are referred to court? Okay? When should police intervene in school disruption matters? How do we identify the underlying problems causing the disruption? What do we do to address those problems given the limited capacity and resources of the school? And how do we ensure the safety of the schools? So for us, as we went through this interactive process, it started off with the schools, the police, and myself. Okay? And we brought in a facilitator. That facilitator was the executive director at that time of the, uh, uh, the uh, Children and Youth Coordinating Council, our state advisory group, which is now the Governor's Office for Children and Families. Um, this person was from outside Clayton County and facilitated. But as we went through, we started getting into these questions. We realized, wait a minute, okay, the problem is informing us uh, that we have these other issues and we need other stakeholders at the table. So we brought in social services. We brought in a parent, a youth. Uh, we brought in the prosecutor, defender, and get this, we brought in the NAACP. Why? Because we looked at our data and we noticed that way too many kids of color, okay, were being captured in this school to prison, the zero tolerance policies that existed in the school system. And we needed somebody there who could share experiences or get folks in the community who can help the group understand the problem Within, the, within this focus of racial and ethnic disparities. And you know what? And to keep us honest on that subject. Keep us honest, all right? So what did, it, what did we do? At the end of the nine months, we came up, we decided, okay, look, we're just gonna start off small. Since 92% of these kids being arrested involved what you see here on, under focus acts, Afraid, disrupting public school, disorderly construction, that's what we're going to target because they're misdemeanor offenses that tend to involve um, typical, that typical juvenile uh, misconduct. So we set up a three tier system first offensive warning, second offense referral to a workshop. It was a school conflict workshop. The court agreed that we would put it on. We had been putting it on for three months. Many of these offenses were being diverted anyway. Okay? What we wanted to do is stop these complaints from even coming to court in the first place. All right, and because we know from the research that um, you know kids uh, who are arrested on campus are twice as likely not to graduate. Now that tends to be for kids who are non-delinquent. But the fact of the matter is, most of these kids arrested were non-delinquent kids anyway, and so it was impacting them negatively. So it's it's not good enough even for juvenile courts to say. Well, you know, I'm doing my part. Um, I'm diverting these cases when they get here. All right, that's good. I'm glad you're doing that. But in terms of your judicial leadership role, knowing this research that by handcuffing the kid, you're already increasing the risk that they're not going to graduate. So it begs the question, should I be playing a role myself as a judicial leader to try to stop that from occurring? Because after all, 1511-1 does obligate juvenile court judges to protect the welfare of every child in his or her jurisdiction. All right? And now with the new juvenile code going into effect January 1st, the purpose of the juvenile code has been redefined. It now, it now has prevention in there. It lays prevention all throughout the code. We now are obligated to prevent these things from happening. But you know what? This last year, we signed a new and what I call improved agreement because what has happened is that we have reduced school arrests by 83% and it's now expanded beyond those focus acts, including even some low-level felonies. Okay? And now what we want to do, what we did is we modified the agreement to reflect our practice today, which is this. 
Those focus acts are now expanded to all misdemeanors, all misdemeanors, except serious bodily injury and drugs. There is no referral on special needs children, kids with IEPs, without consultation with an administrator and counselor in conjunction with the intake officer. That's right. No referral on probationers without consent of the probation officer. That's right. You cannot arrest a probationer, okay, on a school-related offense involving a focus act, okay, um, without first consulting with the probation officer. Uh, because the probation officer may have another way to handle this. A, a graduated sanction may be uh, appropriate for this kid. Officers still, now officers have the discretion not to arrest on a felony that is uh, absent a physical injury. So we've expanded that. We're saying to the officers, hey, just because it's a felony doesn't mean you still have to arrest the kid. Do your investigation. Examine what are the risks, okay, the harms. Uh, is it necessary? Is there another way to handle this? Call our intake. Call the juvenile court for assistance. So here you see, as a result of the protocol, this 83% reduction in school arrests. Notice the dr dramatic decline, not only in misdemeanors, but also in felonies at the same time. Okay? Um, felonies were all, always at a particularly low rate anyway. As I move toward the end here, I want to focus on how a lot of this happened. Because not only did the protocol force uh, the cessation of arrest of low-level offenses, it promoted a cognitive shift in the way adults think in Clayton County within the school system and the police. And today it's been dubbed, it's been written about, and the, the phrase has now been coined, the positive student engagement model for school policing. It's a different way to increase school and community safety. So for example, take a look at this. Uh, the fine print, forget about that. Don't even try to look at it. It's not the purpose of this slide. It's the bubbles you see on the left. You know, when we, in our first year, those boxes that on the right that say level were not on that first year's warning. But after a year, the police came to me, the school resource officers, and they said, Judge, can we add this box that says level? I, I asked why. They said, well, you know, now that we're on campus mostly all day, instead of arresting all these kids, we're getting to know the kids. We're learning things about the kids. And you know what, quite frankly, um, as we learn these things, we realize that arresting them was wrong in the first place. And that these kids have some various needs and issues and problems that there are better ways to handle that than just punishing them. And so we may not want to go to the next level. Can we maybe give them another, another warning? We just need to document it by putting two in the box. And, and about the referral, same thing. Do I have to follow juvenile complaint if I've already made one referral? What if there's a different issue that requires a different type of referral? Then they finally, at the very bottom, asked me about mediation. So we implemented a school-based mediation where we send medi mediators into the schools. And, judge, can we add a line that says other? And this is the interesting part. Why? Well, the lieutenant who headed up the school police said, you see, our police officers are now developing their own programs on campus to help these kids. Something as simple as, you know, um, school-based community service after school, okay? Or instead of suspending the kids, keeping them in school, having them do things. Um, what about school safety? What about community safety? How does this relate? Um, Lieutenant Mark Richards, uh, who was at the time the school resource officer uh, head, made the comment, schools are a microcosm of the community. He says, if you want to know what's going on in the community, talk to the kids. But the problem is, you've got to get them to talk to you. They're not going to talk to you if you're arresting them all for ridiculous stuff and beating them up, practically, emotionally, okay? Um, so he explained that when we stopped doing that, the kids started talking to us, right? And they started sharing. And then they started sharing things really and they were sharing things that were about to happen. 
weapons coming on campus, fights that were going to happen, gang-related activities. Okay? They began to trust the police. All right? It's like Officer Gardner, another school resource officer, said. He calls it the allegory of the school. He said, the schools are like, like this is my school, Monday's Mill High School. Most of them are sheep. They make a lot of noise. They get in some trouble here and there, school fights, yell things off, get disorderly. But you know what? When you really look at the kids that are the predators, I mean the ones who are there to really cause some serious problem, there are not as many. He said, out of my school of 1,200, I probably had no more than 18 of those wolves, he called them. Only 18. And you know what? He said, it finally dawned on me what Judge Teske was saying, okay? And that is, Gardner, why are you arresting all the sheep? They're not the problem. They just make you mad. They're not the ones that scare you. It's those 18 wolves. Focus on them. Figure out strategies on them. And when we found ourselves on campus now, spending more time there, we identified those 18 wolves, and we developed strategies of dealing with them. And it protected everyone else and made the school safer. So let's take a look at how this works. It's kind of messed up here on this slide. But step one is you decrease minor school referrals. When that happens, in step two, you will increase police presence. In step three, in so doing, you will increase intelligence, that is information gathering, if you apply the positive student engagement model by positively engaging the students. That begins with, first of all, stop arresting them on a bunch of ridiculous stuff. And then finally, you will find a safer climate. In this case, I say step four, I looked at the weapons. We looked at weapons. Here we have. These are DF weapons in Clayton County, uh, or at the time they were designated felony. That is, these are under zero tolerance laws. Under state law, they have to be reported. The police have to refer these things, okay? Now, we, the police weren't arresting these kids, okay, you know, putting handcuffs on them, but nonetheless, unless it involved a gun, of course, or a weapon in an assault, as our present DF law requires. But there was a 70% reduction in weapons on campus. Why? Why, if this is a static factor? That is, the law required they had to be reported. And the police explained, upon being surveyed, it's because the kids are telling us what's going to happen. They're sharing this with us, and they're helping us out. Um, here's a trap house right across from a high school. None of the adults knew that it was there, selling drugs until after using the protocol, doing this positive student engagement, the kids shared this with the police. Hey, did you know this is what's going on over there? They did their surveillance, made the arrest. Here you have marijuana, you have AK-47 drums, $7,000 cash, you see all the automatic clips, and it goes on and on and on and on. That is a safer school zone, because there was a trap house there, there's not a trap house today, okay? And we also want to help our leaders, our police chief, our school superintendent, to avoid a media dilemma. That is, how is the media and community going to respond if a person comes on school campus tragically, like we did, it had happened at Sandy Hook, with a gun, and your SRO is at intake booking a student on a school fight or disorderly conduct? That's just not going to look good. And so how do you bridge now? This is one of those problem-informed questions. You know, the schools have to still address these disruptive students. So we're not going to arrest them, and that was an easy tool for them. Push them off the campus. Let's try to dump them into the, into the court system, okay? Well, what are we going to do with these chronically disruptive kids? And that's where the schools need help. We've got to be careful not to blame the schools. They're limited in their resources. We already know that it's already difficult with the population they deal with in terms of IEPs and the monies they have to spend on that. Um, there's a much greater population of chronically disruptive kids who'll never be diagnosed with, with, with a, uh, uh, to get an IEP. And so it's very easy to say, you know, I really don't have the resources for these kids because I've got to spend the resources on these kids over here that are diagnosed EBD or uh, LD or ADHD. Okay, so the schools need help, and that's what's great about this collaborative system and judges coming and bringing everyone together because it forces the question to be asked, well then, how do we bridge this gap? How can we get these community resources out there like an MST, wraparound services, and so forth, 
to, to, to uh, these families that need help dealing with their own children who are chronically disruptive. And so we, we had developed this, this system of care, which today Clayton County has a full-time administrator paid for in partnership between the school system uh, and uh, the uh, Clayton County Board of Commissioners. Uh, have come together, signed an MOU, and they now uh, pay the administrative costs uh, for our system of care. Uh, there is a full-time administrator, there's a full-time assistant administrator. Uh, we now have a probation officer who is dedicated solely to chronically disruptive kids and probationers um, and help out in, in the schools, okay? It, this results in, in, in increasing graduation rates. I mean, who would ever think that keeping kids in school will increase graduation rates, okay? I mean, who would ever think that, right? Come on, all right? It's sad, and I think that's what's troubling today when we hear about kids being uh, suspended or expelled from school uh, for, for things that we know they're not delinquent. They're really not delinquent, but it pushes them out of school. It disrupts their educational process, okay? And when that happens, it has a traumatic effect on them, a negative impact that can put them on a pathway toward delinquency. We unwittingly, in a zero-tolerance policy world, make kids worse. We contribute to our own crime rate. We put them in a pipeline that will lead them to prison, for which we're going to have somebody present about this back end. I'm talking about the front end. You're going to have somebody coming in after me talking about this back end. The school I'm talking about, front end, approaches to dealing with it, to stop the flow to what our next speaker is going to be talking about, and that's the prison part. So what do we do? We now assess disruptive students. That is, we ask, why is Johnny disruptive? We then develop alternatives to suspension and referral to treat the causes. That results in increasing graduation rates. And so we've developed this multi-system integrated service governance structure that meets every quarter. In fact, our next governance meeting is next week. It includes the sheriff, the chief of police, the district attorney, the director of the Board of Health, the director of our local mental health department, our director of DFACS, uh, the presiding judge, myself, um, uh, on this and they meet. Um, they, we, we have a single point of entry uh, we call the Quad CST, that is the Clayton County Collaborative Child Study Team. They meet every week, sometimes twice, three times a week. They meet in the schools. And what, the way this works is now, so when the school system has a chronically disruptive Johnny who's on a pathway to expulsion, they refer the kid to the Quad CST which is a multidisciplinary panel who assesses Johnny and the family and comes up with a treatment plan, something the school was not able to do before. They don't have the resources. Now we've pulled the resources together in the community to make this happen. And as a result, we have found an 83% improvement in behavior with these chronically disruptive Johnnies. We have found at least a 23% increase in reading and math scores with these chronically disruptive Johnnies because they're getting services in the home in the community and in the school. Our graduation rates, this is kind of off here, have increased over this period of time. Our overall graduation rates by 24 percent, okay? Uh, and, and so with that, I want to end with this. Coming right back full circle, what does this mean about disproportionate minority contact? What does this mean about reducing racial and ethnic disparities? Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing we need to do is reduce these referrals because we already know that those who tend to be captured the most are kids of color. And if we can decrease these arrest rates, these suspension rates, we are going mathematically reduce uh, the, the, the number of kids of color that are being suspended, being expelled. We need to work on keeping them in school. I also want to draw your attention to the Texas Appleseed study. Um, which digs and mines deeper into explaining why many kids of color end up getting uh, suspended, expelled, and arrested. And what we have found and learned from the Texas Appleseed study, uh, it's a very extensive study, is that it really comes down to culture. It comes down to not understanding the way people speak, 
I mean, from a cultural perspective, and quite frankly, taken it uh, in a way not intended by uh, the student. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to leave you with that, uh, and if there are any questions that you have of me uh, related to this, you can email me uh, at Steve dot Teske, T E S K E, at CO dot Clayton dot GA dot US. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. My name is Elliot Schoenthal. I'm one of the juvenile court judges in DeKalb County. And before I start my presentation, I would like to do a couple of things. I'd like to thank a few people. First, I'd like to thank Governor and First Lady Deal for their continued support of the Office for Children and Families and for the uh, Disproportionate Minority Contact Committee. I'd also like to thank Katie Jo Ballard and Samantha Bearden, who are also with the Governor's Office for Children and Families, particularly Samantha, who put this whole thing together and did all the work to get us here today. And finally, I'd like to thank Melissa Carter, the Barton Law Clinic, and Emory Law School for allowing us to use their facilities and for making this uh, presentation possible here today. Now, by way of introduction, I am a member of the Georgia Dem Disproportionate Minority Contact Committee. I've been a full-time juvenile court judge for eight years in DeKalb County, and I was a part-time judge for about 10 years prior to that. Now, we are what's called an independent court. That is, we do not rely on the Department of Juvenile Justice to provide us with intake facilities, that is, uh, intake officers who receive complaints, file those complaints, uh, determine what children will be detained or will be released, what cases will be diverted. We are what's called a independent, an independent court. That is, we provide our own and have our own independent probation services, probation officers, our own independent intake services. So we do not rely on the Department of Juvenile Justice for probation supervision or anything like that. In fact, our probation officers handle all the supervision for children who are placed on probation or whatever kind, whether that's informal or formal probation. And our intake department handles all of the logistics of uh, receiving complaints and processing those. Now, we have no control over what children are brought to us in court. That's done by uh, school resource officers, school referrals of some kind for truancies and things like that. Uh, it's also done through police officers or just individuals coming down and filing complaints, parents or other people. We do have some control, however, over whether those children are detained and then how their cases are processed. So we do make use of the Department of Juvenile Justice's uh, alternative to incarceration or alternatives to detention. That is, GPS ankle monitors, we use those through the Department of Juvenile Justice. They have some in-home uh, counseling services, sometimes called wraparound services, that we will uh, avail ourselves of. And we also use their group homes or their uh, or detention alternatives where children can be placed instead of in the RYDC or in secure detention, uh, they can be placed in a sort of a halfway type of house. They're not able to go home for certain reasons, but they certainly don't need to be detained. And we use all of those available options to us that the Department of Juvenile Justice provides. Now once a case comes to us and gets past the detentional phase, that is whether the child will be detained or whether they'll be released, uh, we then have several diversion options that we have and we hopefully will use uh, to keep children from becoming adjudicated delinquent. That will necessarily prevent them from coming into the juvenile justice system, but we hope that that will at least enable them to avoid an adjudication of delinquency. And that's what I'm here for today is to discuss some of the programs that we have in DeKalb County that we use to try to divert cases and to try to avoid children having adjudications on their record. The first program I was going to talk to you about today is a brand new one that we've just started. It's funded from a grant from the Criminal Justice Coordinating Council, and it's called the Commitment Alternative Program, or CAP. The basic idea of this program is to try to reduce referrals to the Department of Juvenile Justice. So our goal is to try to take cases that would otherwise go to the Department of Juvenile Justice or cases that might result in some sort of detention that is a short-term treatment program, which is often referred to as boot camp. It's a 30-day uh, program. It's uh, been reduced over the years from 90 days to 60 days to now 30 days. And that's the maximum amount on certain cases that we can detain a child if, if it's appropriate. 
What the CAP program is designed to do is to eliminate or reduce those uh, short-term treatment program referrals for 30 days of detention and to reduce some of the re referrals and commitments to the Department of Juvenile Justice. For those of you who are not familiar with those commitments, there are two types of commitments to the Department of Juvenile Justice. The first is a regular two-year commitment. That's a commitment where the child is not necessarily detained and in most instances is not detained. But in effect, what happens is it's a two-year probated sentence. That the probation is then carried out or supervised by the Department of Juvenile Justice. So for instance, if I had a child come in front of me and for whatever reason thought that our probation department could not properly supervise that child, perhaps we didn't have a program in our court that that child particularly needed, but we thought the Department of Juvenile Justice did have such a program or had some better opportunity to serve that child or that family, I would commit that child to the Department of, family, uh, to Department of Juvenile Justice for a period of two years. Again, they would not be detained for two years. They would simply be supervised or on probation with the Department of Juvenile Justice for up to that two-year period. The other commitment, however, to the Department of Juvenile Justice is a five-year commitment. And that's a commitment where the child is detained for some period of time. Under the current law, the minimum period of time would be 12 months. The maximum would be 60 months or five years. And of course, that depends on the seriousness of the offense and the type of offense and the type of record that the child has. So again, the CAP program is in implemented uh, to try to reduce those referrals so that children will not be committed in the first place, and if they are committed, hopefully, they, or if they are not committed, that hopefully they will not be detained either, and we can reduce those referrals. Now these cases, to some extent, are targeting children who are between 13 and 17, that's the, the age limit that we're dealing with, and again, we're trying to reduce those referrals to the Department of Juvenile Justice so if I have a child who's come before me and has been on probation for three or four or five times, I might otherwise commit them to the Department of Juvenile Justice. At that point, after we've supervised them for a number of years, had them go through a number of programs, obviously we have not been successful. If we had been, they would not be coming back three or four or five times, and I would not be putting them back on probation over and over again. So that's the type of child who I might commit to the Department of Juvenile Justice for a period of two years. This is an intensive program, intensive supervision program that's designed to try to cut down on those types of commitments. It's a community-based and a court-based program, which means we have uh, team meetings, we'll have judicial reviews, mentoring programs, tutoring programs. There might be a community service component to it, parenting classes, and other types of ongoing classes that the children are required to attend. Uh, one of the things is a Saturday tutoring program. Uh, as many of you know, a lot of the children that we deal with uh, have learning disabilities, they have problems in school, uh, they're not motivated to go to school or to uh, participate in school, their grades are not particularly good, and in many instances their parents are not particularly engaged with the school or the child's education. So this program is designed to try to address some of those, those issues. The average period of probation we expect to be between 9 and 12 months. Again, it's an intensive probation supervision program. Uh, it's intended, again, to do that to avoid those commitments and those referrals for detention. Uh, we've just started the program. As I understand it, it's going to go through the spring. I think it's either April or May. And our goal is to uh, refer between 30 and 60 children. And I believe we're well on our way. Most of those referrals have already been made by the probation officers on existing cases that they think would be appropriate. And as we get into the program further, uh, the judges will start making referrals when the cases come before us for disposition. The second program I was going to talk with you about is our mediation program. Uh, mediation kind of speaks for itself. We do have a mediation program not only for delinquent cases but also for deprived or, or dependency cases. But as far as delinquent cases goes, that program is funded through probation supervision fees. There are a limited number of uses that probation supervision fees can be used for, and one of them is a mediation program, and that's what we are using it for. I have found over the years, and I've expressed this to people when they're in court, that when the parties are able to work out a solution, their own solution to their problem, uh, whether it's a civil or a criminal type of case, if it's appropriate, then they're usually happier with the result. Uh, it's not me or some other judge imposing something on them, but it's them working it out with the other side in the case, and hopefully they will be more apt to uh, live with that solution and abide by it. I think it's particularly effective uh, when dealing with school issues. It is student versus student. When the students have a conflict, a fight at school, something like that. 
uh, particularly effective in cases maybe involving theft. Uh, I think it also helps when there's a neighborhood problem where parties are, uh, you know, uh, disagreement or have some problem in the neighborhood between neighbors or people in the same, uh, same area who are having problems with uh, uh, vandalism, things like that where, where there's some sort of underlying uh, conflict between the families. Uh, mediation tends to be a very good solution to that. I think mediation also works well in restitution issues where it's not a question of wanting some sort of... Uh, retribution from the other side. It's just we want to be paid for our damages or our loss, and we want that to be uh, refunded to us. So uh, the parties sometimes can sit down with a mediator and can maybe work out a solution to the amount of restitution. It, we have always tell people in court it's very difficult to get restitution out of an adult. Uh, try getting it out of a, of a 13 or 14 year old. It's virtually impossible for obvious reasons. So if the parties can come to some sort of a, an agreement on an amount somewhere maybe in the middle, uh, they usually are both happier with it and there's a more of a likelihood that it will actually be paid. Uh, mediation, as many of you know, is only as good as the people who are working in it. So you have to have good mediators, but you also have to have parties who are motivated to, to participate and keep an open mind and be willing to compromise. Obviously, there are certain cases that are not accepted by mediation, violent offenses, things where there's been some serious injuries, stuff like that, uh, probably would not be appropriate for mediation. Uh, sex offenses, other types of things like that, serious offenses generally are not appropriate for mediation, but a lot of the cases we have probably are, and we probably should use it more often than we do. The third program I wanted to speak with you about is our mental health court. It's called the Journey Mental Health Accountability Court. And as many of you know, accountability courts have kind of taken off recently uh, in, the, in the fields of mental health and uh, uh, drug uh, rehabilitation and drug courts, things like that. And we've recently started a mental health court. Now, it's limited to girls, and those girls are age 13 to 16. So it hasn't expanded uh, to a different age group yet or to boys. But for girls 13 through 16, uh, if they have a diagnosed mental illness, it has to be diagnosed, obviously, by a physician, uh, then they are eligible for the program. Now, we accept misdemeanors and felonies. I think there probably would be some felonies that might not be appropriate, but for right now, those are the, those are the parameters of the program. Uh, it's funded by a Criminal Justice Coordinating Council grant, and it's run by our chief judge, uh, Judge Piegler, who presides over those cases, and anyone can make a referral, so that could be through a probation department uh, officer, it could be from one of the judges, the district attorney, the public defender. And we try to get those girls who obviously have a, a, a diagnosed, obvious mental illness that needs to be treated, again, out of being prosecuted and into being treated. It's an accountability treatment type of court. And again, what I would do is I would actually postpone disposition on a child who I thought was appropriate for the, for the program. I would refer the case to the Journey program. They would do an assessment or an evaluation to see if that child qualified for the program and assuming that she did. The case would be transferred to the other judge who would handle that, and assuming the child completes the program, uh, then the, uh, there would be no adjudication and the, and the petition would be dismissed or withdrawn. If for some reason, however, the child did not complete the program successfully or was not appropriate for it or not accepted into the program, then she would be sent back to me and I would go forward with whatever disposition I thought was appropriate at that time. The next program I wanted to mention to you is called Points 2. POINT stands for Providing Optimal Intervention Needed to Succeed. Uh, that's a program that's actually taught by the school resource officers, the SROs at the school. And it's, again, obviously, uh, by virtue of that, is designed to try to divert cases that are in the school itself. Uh, minor fights, uh, thefts, things like that, uh, other disagreements between students. Again, if a properly trained SRO can intervene at that point, uh, I think you may have heard from Judge Teske, or you will hear from Judge Teske, about uh, those types of cases and referrals, uh, then we can keep a child from even coming into the juvenile justice system in the first place. Or if they're already there and we refer them to the program, then they can hopefully avoid an adjudication and the case can be resolved without having to come to court or without having to have an adjudication. Uh, those are for minor nonviolent offenses that again occur in the school. And again, if a well-trained SRO is involved, uh, they can avoid a lot of cases coming to court. We've found over the years that when an SRO is proactive and not reactive, and when I say not reactive, I mean does not allow a child to entice them into charging them. You know, the, the, the SROs know these children pretty well, particularly at our alternative schools. 
and they know which children are you know, habitual problems and, and are troublemakers and things like that. And there's certainly a, a tendency sometimes for them to provoke these children or to overreact perhaps to what the children are doing. Uh, just by virtue of the reputation that child has, and of course those cases then come to court. If we have better trained SROs, perhaps they can avoid some of those referrals and keep those cases in the schools where they probably ought to remain. Next I wanted to mention one of our other accountability courts, and that's the Rebound Drug Accountability Court. That's run by one of our judges, Judge Bratton Haynes. She's been doing that for a number of years. It's a very good program. It's been recognized nationally. It's been very successful, and we're very proud of it. That's targeted at young men aged 14 to 16. Those, that's the only age group and the only um, demographic that we're dealing with at this point in the program. It's about a 12 to 16 month program. There is some provision, I think, for aftercare after the 16 months. It's also a CJCC uh, grant that funds that. And it's, like I said, a very successful program. It's a very difficult program. Uh, I think a lot of the children obviously have difficulty with it, uh, at least initially. Uh, it's very intensive. The, there are programs going on seven days a week, and those children have contact with someone from the court every day of the week. Uh, there's a designated probation officer who works with the children. Uh, they go on uh, programs, community service. Uh, a lot of writing exercises and obviously treatment to try to address the underlying problem because most of the children we get are not in court because of drug cases. They're in court for other reasons and they unfortunately have attendant drug issues. They're self-medicating or they're uh, just involved in drugs and we're trying to you know, break that cycle. That again can be referred by one of the judges, the district attorney, the public defender, and again they will go to that, uh, that uh, department. They will do an assessment, they'll do an evaluation to see if the child qualifies for the program, if the child will be a good fit, because it is such an intensive and a difficult program to complete, not everybody can do that, and of course the parents have to be on board with most of these programs, particularly this program, and if they're not on board and are not willing to put in the time that they need to put in, then obviously the child will not be successful. So they do the assessment, assuming the child qualifies, the case is transferred to Judge Bratton Haynes, and she uh, handles the case from there. And again, if the child successfully completes the program, there is no adjudication. The petition is withdrawn or dismissed. If the child does not complete the, pro the program, then eventually that case would be sent back to me for final disposition. And again, I would, would uh, enter a disposition at that point. Now, the next program I wanted to mention to you is our teen court program. That's targeted at first offenses, misdemeanors, and what happens is that we go into the community, to the high schools in DeKalb County, and try to recruit students who want to be on the teen court, that is, they want to be the actors and the uh, personnel in that court. So we have a student prosecutor, defense attorney, judge, jury, and they get cases that are referred to them. They're trained by the district attorney's office, and then they receive cases, and it's basically a trial in front of their peers. So the child who's been accused of some offense comes in there, and the case is presented by the students to their judge or jury, and then they render a verdict, and of course at that point they uh, dis decide on a disposition. Uh, we found again that when uh, young people uh, judge their peers, sometimes that not only are the sentences maybe more appropriate or, or tailored more to the children, but the accused child at that point probably will uh, accept it in a little better fashion because it's their peers, not necessarily their friends or anybody they know, but their students from other schools who are listening to the cases. We've also found that sometimes the students are a lot harder on the children than, uh, than we would be, but uh, they again can order community service, uh, some sort of uh, book report or essay, things like that to try to resolve the case. Again, we found that that's not only helpful for the children who are accused of these cases, but also for the children who are sitting as the prosecutor, the judge, the pu uh, public defender. Uh, it's very good training for them, and it gives them a very good insight into the uh, criminal and, and juvenile court justice system. Now, the next program I was going to mention to you is our TIME program. That stands for Tutoring, Intervention, Mentoring, and Employment. And as you can tell by the name, tutoring, intervention, mentoring, and employment, the idea is to get children who need some extra help with school, 
uh, need someone to possibly uh, set an example for them that they don't already have in their lives and to get them on the track not only for school but for possible employment down the road. This is 16 to 18 year olds. They have to be enrolled in school. It's an after school support program and it's funded by the DeKalb Workforce Grant. Uh, again, what that program will do is provide mentoring to these children, uh, you know, positive role models, things like that, uh, tutoring and extra help with subjects and, and things that they're struggling with, perhaps. Uh, there are uh, uh, trips to uh, colleges, there are employment uh, information and training, uh, all sorts of things like that to get the children to start thinking about uh, college, whether it's two years or four years, to think about perhaps some other track uh, other than uh, college and any other job opportunities and uh, means of getting a job, you know, filling out applications, uh, doing interviews, uh, making up a resume, things like that. So these are programs that were designed to try to help children who are actually in school but perhaps struggling a little bit and need a little bit of extra help. The next program, which is sort of parallel to that program, the TIME program, is one that we're very proud of. It's been nationally recognized again for its success. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you in a minute some of, some of the uh, experiences I've had with the program. But it's the Youth Achievement Program, or YAP, or YAP. Uh, that program is designed, again, for 16 to 18-year-olds. But those are children who are not enrolled in school. They have dropped out for whatever reason. And it's a GED type of program to get these children an uh, equivalency diploma, uh, to get them, again, job training, uh, interview skills, how to dress for an interview. Uh, J.C. Penney in the past has been very kind and generous in providing uh, clothing allowances to some of the children. Uh, they go, again, on tours to local colleges and colleges in the southeast. Uh, they have speakers come in. Uh, they work on, again, different uh, job opportunities and school opportunities. Again, you have to remember that a lot of the children we deal with uh, are not thinking about college. They're lucky if one of their parents completed high school, and they may not be thinking about college as an option. So anytime we can put that uh, seed in their mind that, yes, you can go to college, and yes, you can achieve, and yes, you can be successful, it may be one of the only times they hear those kind words. Uh, so we try to encourage them as much as we can. I have found over the years that most of the children who have come in front of me in court are very bright and very talented. Uh, the problem is they're not motivated or they've lost interest or uh, no one has assisted them in, in exploring those talents and, and their potential. And uh, it's a shame to see that potential wasted. So programs like this have been very successful in getting those kids back on track. From a personal standpoint, uh, I've gone to all of the graduations over the last couple of years for the uh, Youth Achievement Program. We have a big a graduation ceremony, the children wear caps and gowns, uh, pomp and circumstances is played, families are there, there's a reception for everybody, uh, the children come down and get their, their diploma, uh, the, the pride and the joy in the faces of the parents and the families is overwhelming, and I think the, uh, the same is true for the children who you know, otherwise would not have completed high school. They were lost, they were off track and didn't know what to do, and the program has gotten them through it. I was fortunate enough last year have one of my uh, kids in my court uh, sent me an invitation. I would have gone to the ceremony anyway, but she sent me a personal invitation. I was very pleased and very proud of her to be there to watch her walk down the aisle and receive her diploma. So that's an excellent program that we, we provide, and uh, we're very proud of that. The next thing I was going to discuss is our youth diversion program. The youth diversion program is made up of volunteers from the community. Uh, there are seven panels of volunteers throughout DeKalb County. Uh, those are adults. <clears throat> they are citizen volunteers who hear these cases. Uh, they're first time or minor offenses, and then they impose sentences on those children. So it's very similar in some ways to the teen court, some of the other programs that we have, but these are actually adult volunteers in the community who hear uh, different cases and then impose a sentence. Again, that could be community service. It could be um, uh, an essay, reading a book, uh, any number, apology letter to a victim, things like that. Uh, they'll come up with an appropriate sentence, they'll craft that for the particular child and family, and then that case again is diverted so that the child does not receive an adjudication. <clears throat> the next thing I wanted to mention to you, which is available in any court, which is the informal probation or an informal adjustment. That is, when a case comes in front of, of me, the district attorney can ask, the public defender can ask, and I can do this, I can put the child on informal probation. So instead of them being on a formal probated sentence, 
I can make it informal. What's the advantage of that? Well, one advantage is it's a 90-day program. So right off the bat, they're only on probation for 90 days as opposed to possibly six months, nine months, a year. It's a much shorter period of probation. If they successfully complete the probation, the informal probation, then there is no adjudication. That's the, that's the carrot at, at the end of the line, I suppose. Uh, those cases can be referred by the probation department, by the intake department, so when they get a case that comes in, they can screen that case out and say, we're not even going to send this to the district attorney, we're not even going to prosecute this case, we're going to send it to our informal folks and let them handle it. Uh, sometimes those are also handled with unruly or ungovernable children, children who are not committing delinquent acts, but they're having problems at home, the parents are having problems with the behavior, things like that, uh, not returning home, not going to school, things like that. And that can be handled very, very well through the informal probation or informal adjustment. Again, a lot of those kids will receive some sort of community service. Uh, they may receive some sort of counseling services if that's appropriate. Uh, that may be referred again for some sort of an essay or a book report or something like that. And since I've mentioned essays and book reports several times here, uh, let me tell you a little about what, what I do on some of these cases. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, we have, uh, over the years, developed a few books that uh, or I've read, actually. I figured if I was going to make children read the books, I should read them myself. So uh, one is uh, Letters to a Young Brother. Uh, one is A Question of Freedom. And another book is Exactly as I Am. Those are three of the books, main books that we use. There are others. Uh, they're inspirational books. They're very easy to read, very you know, easy reads and quick reads. Uh, they're geared towards children who may not you know, have a, a father or a parent figure of some kind in their lives. Uh, who may be a little bit off track or lost. Uh, it's for self-esteem issues, things like that. They're very good books. Sometimes they're hard to find. Uh, but those are some of the books that I'll have the children read and then write a report and to, to talk to them about the book, find out if, it did, if they did enjoy it and what they got out of it or what they thought was important from it or if there's something that they can take from that book. Uh, some of the book reports are excellent. It's obviously the children have read the book. And I think in many instances, they've actually enjoyed it and gotten something positive out of the book. Um, we'll also have them write essays. Sometimes if a book is not appropriate or if I think they're going to have a difficult time finding the book or actually being able to read the book uh, or under, under circumstances, we might have them do an essay. What are some goals that you have set for yourself? How do you achieve those goals? Uh, why is education an important thing for you in your life? Uh, what negative effect have drugs or other things had on your life? And try to get the kids thinking about the problem themselves and maybe putting it down in writing as to what, what they think the, the, the problems are or the issues are and how maybe they can get past those. Try to get them to come up with some solutions instead of us lecturing to them or telling them how to do it. Let them start thinking a little bit on their own. And uh, I think that's been a very successful and, and we've had a lot, of, uh, a lot of good results with that. The uh, informal probation or informal adjustment is supervised by a probation officer. Again, successful completion means no adjudication or a dismissal or no petition maybe in the first place, which is always a good thing. Now, one of the things that we've started doing over the last couple of years is our own informal, informal probation. That is, instead of sending a case to the informal probation department, we'll do our own internal hold open. That is, we'll hold the case for probably the same period of time, about 90 days. We have a form that we have different checkoffs for things to do. Mostly it's stay out of trouble, go to school, listen to your folks. It might be to write an apology letter, or do some community service, make some restitution, uh, read one of the books, do a report, whatever it might be. And then if the child successfully completes that, they then come back and we again withdraw the petition, dismiss the petition, and there's no adjudication. Uh, one of the reasons we did that was uh, we started that was it not only gives us a little bit more control over the progress of the case, but not everybody needs to be on probation, and our probation department is short-staffed as it is, and they've got uh, caseloads that are probably heavier than they should have because of being short-staffed. So we thought that we'd take a little of the burden off of them, and in those cases that didn't necessarily need supervision, but just needed the child to do something in, uh, in, a, in a short period of time, and then the case could be resolved. Those are kids who have no prior record or their minor record of some kind. Uh, we're, we're willing to do that, and I think, again, that's been very successful uh, in our court anyway, my court. The last one I wanted to mention is our truancy intervention program. As many of you know, <clears throat> and it, it's not uh, rocket science, children who don't go to school generally wind up becoming delinquent. So today's truant child could be tomorrow's delinquent child. The first thing I look at on any burglary case on the police report is the time and the day 
of the burglary. And then I look at my calendar to see if that was a school day and school hours, and invariably it is. I'd say 90% of our burglary cases occur on school days during school hours when the child should have been in school but wasn't. Now, not all of our truancy cases involve delinquency cases, but there is a, a definite correlation and a connection there. So if we can get kids back in school, that's a win-win for everyone. It means no, no less burglaries, hopefully, uh, less uh, kids coming to court, less adjudications, and more kids getting a good education, which is bottom line of what we're trying to do with our truancy program. Uh, that's a program that Judge Bratton Haynes, myself, and Judge Crawford participate in. One of the things we'll do is when, a, when we get a referral from one of the schools, we've kind of split up the county in three, and we take different schools, middle schools and high schools throughout the county. Uh, if a school, re uh, school uh, social worker contacts one of us and says, look, uh, we've got a child here, or we've got some, uh, several children who are starting to get some, or they're starting to rack up some truant dates. They're not, they're, they're not coming to school. They're unexcused absences. Before we send out a formal truancy notice, before we proceed with a formal truancy referral to the court, we'd like you to come out and talk to them, and we're happy to do that. We've done these truancy interventions for years at many of the schools throughout DeKalb County. So we'll go out to the school. We'll meet informally in a, in a small group with the children and their families. Uh, and we will discuss with them the legal ramifications of not coming to school, but also more of the practical things. Why aren't you going to school? Is it just you don't like school? Or are you being bullied? Or do you have to stay home and take care of your three-year-old brother? Or is your mom sick? Or is there some other reason you don't have transportation? Whatever it might be. Uh, I think there are many reasons why children go, don't go to school, and we need to find out what those reasons are so that we can then get those people hooked up with the services that might help them with that situation. And that's what we try to do with our truancy interventions. Find out what the issue is, what the problem is, and then make a referral to the appropriate kind of counseling or, or other services that might be helpful. Now, sometimes those cases get beyond that and may come, actually come to court uh, because the child has missed uh, 10 days or more, is about to miss 10 days or more of school, unexcused. So we'll do a calendar, an actual calendar, not at the school, but in the court, where we'll bring those folks in, the children and their parents, and we'll have a, you know, a, a meeting and we'll discuss, again, the law with them, why they're there, and then at that time we have uh, school social workers there, we have service providers there, we have probation officers there, and we actually put the children on a 90-day informal probated sentence. Again, if they successfully complete it, that is, start going to school, then we can uh, dismiss the case and there's no there's no petition, there's, there's no further action in court. Uh, if the child is not, then it's up to the district attorney's office to decide whether they want to prosecute that truancy case or not. It's a practical matter. Truancy cases are very difficult to prosecute, not legally, but there's really no consequence that we can impose on a child who doesn't go to school. We can't lock them up, not that we would or should, but we can't, and there's really no leverage there uh, to get those children back in court. So we hope that the majority of those children believe or become convinced that education is important, that it's their ticket to a successful future, and that they will listen to us and, and hopefully get back on track. And we've been pretty successful with that. Obviously, there are some children who don't want to go to school and never will go to school, um, and hopefully the schools will start to uh, provide more services for those children and maybe get them some additional uh, assistance and training that will help them down the road. Now, we have little or no control, as I said, of the children who end up in our court. We don't bring them into our court. They're sent there by other folks. Uh, we do have a lot to say, however, how their cases are handled. So we have to accept the fact, and we have, I think, that children end up in the juvenile justice system for a variety of reasons. Uh, and some of those children shouldn't be sent to court, but they end up there because of their ethnicity, uh, because of their race, because of their background, and sometimes just because of the part of town or the part of the county where they might live. Um, there's not much that we can do about that, at least through the court, but we can level that playing field. So once those children do come to us, we can then make a decision that perhaps they shouldn't be in court, there's no reason for them to be, or it's just not uh, the, the appropriate thing for them to do. And we can then try to level that playing field and try to even things out as best as we can. So our diversion programs are designed to do that. Um, they're designed to try to get children out of the juvenile justice system whenever possible and whenever appropriate, if we can do that in a, in a safe and an appropriate way. Uh, we're committed to reducing the number of minority children who are referred to our court in the first place, the number of children who are detained. Of course, we have control over that as to whether they should be detained or not, and the number of children whose cases result in an adjudication of delinquency. We ultimately have that decision-making power. 
So we're hopeful, and we do hope, and we're confident that the diversion programs, and these are just some of the ones that we have, but the diversion programs that we provide in the DeKalb County Juvenile Court will accomplish that goal. Uh, I wanted to uh, just say briefly in conclusion, that is, as I said, these are not all the programs we have. These are some of the main ones. If anyone has any questions about any of the programs, how they work, how they're funded, uh, feel free to contact me and I will get you to the appropriate person. Generally speaking, I don't have the answer to a lot of things that people ask me, but I usually know who to tell you to speak to and I can usually find the right person to, to put you in contact with. Uh, I hope this presentation has been informative. I hope it's given you some things to think about and maybe some uh, things that you'll try to implement in your court or in your school or in your, in your community. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. The best way to do that is by email. And you can contact me at E.A. Schoenthal, that's E-A-S-H-O-E-N-T-H-A-L, at DeKalbCountyGA.gov. So that's D-E-K-A-L-B, CountyGA.gov. I would very much look forward to meeting with you and speaking to you. And if I can be of any assistance, please let me know. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Steve Reba. I'm an attorney at the Barton Child Law and Policy Center uh, at Emory Law School. Uh, at Barton, I, re I direct uh, a legal clinic called Appeal for Youth. Uh, we represent pr predominantly foster kids uh, who are somehow trapped in the school to prison pipeline. That might be suspension or expulsion representation, juvenile delinquency representation, or where I spend most of my time. Uh, in Georgia's prisons representing youthful offenders, kids we call SB440s. So close to 20 years ago, uh, in 1994, Georgia passed a law we refer to colloquially as the seven deadly sins. Uh, we made seven offenses, uh, murder, voluntary manslaughter, aggravated sexual battery, aggravated sodomy, aggravated child molestation, rape and armed robbery, uh, we made these seven fences automatically transferable to our adult courts. So kids as young as 13, if charged with one of these offenses, are automatically tried in our adult, adult criminal courts and face the exact same adult sentences uh, that, you know, adult defendants face. So I spend a significant amount of my time uh, in the corners of, of Georgia's many, many prisons speaking with youthful offenders about misbegotten childhoods, uh, offenses committed long ago, and the often uh, brutal realities uh, of prison life. And when I talk about the school to prison pipeline and, and DMC, uh, I like to uh, broach the subject from the perspective uh, of these kids in prison. And as Judge Teske referenced in, in his presentation, uh, where he addressed largely the front end of the system and, and does so in, in an incredibly inspiring way, I, I'm really going to talk about the back end of the system because I think there's some important lessons that we can all learn uh, when, when addressing or dealing with the front end of the system from the kids on the back end. And as I mentioned, I uh, I'm essentially trying to get these, these kids out of Georgia's prisons uh, through legal actions we called habeas corpus, where we're challenging their convictions and sentence, sentences. A and in the, in the process of doing that, we often uh, subpoena thousands of, of school records and, and child welfare records and sort of piece together our client's history. Okay. These kids were 13, 14, 15, 16 years old when they committed their offenses and now they're serving life sentences, 10, 20, 30, even life without parole sentences uh, in prison. And in looking through these kids' records, uniformly, every single child had problems in, in school. And in to a client, uh, all of them committed their offense, their SB 440 offense, uh, in a pro in the proximity to which, in which that offense was committed is, is extraordinarily close to when they lost the structure uh, of school. Okay. So these are kids. Uh, many of these kids were, were probably the wolves that, that Judge Teske was referring to, um, who, when they do show up to school, 
they got into serious, serious trouble. Uh, and, and the schools suspended or expelled these students, and they, they lost the structure uh, of school. Um, they also did not have the structure uh, of family, and they slip into our criminal justice systems uh, often by committing one of these uh, seven deadly offenses. Not often by committing one of these seven deadly offenses, but I see the, the kids who, who, have, uh, who have arrived in our prisons by, by committing uh, the seven deadly sins. So, what I want to talk to you about today is, is very, very simple, and it's what I take from Judge Teske's uh, substantive uh, presentation, basically the fundamental reason why we take that approach, and it's about getting to know these kids. It's, the, it's about the power of narratives, and it's about the power of biographies. Uh, because while I spend most of my time mitigating uh, with, with substantive legal claims that surround you know, criminal procedure, really what I'm doing is I'm a biographer. I'm finding facts out about these kids that no one knew. Persuasive facts. Facts that went to the abuse they suffered, the neglect. These facts that no one ever knew about them as they slipped through our systems. And oftentimes, I'm, I'm meeting these clients when they're in their 20s and 30s, and themselves. They, they forget that they suffer these things, and only these records document them. My point being, it's too late, often, when I come to a case and I learn this, this information. I mean, we are sometimes successful in litigating these claims and using these facts and persuading people perhaps to alter a sentence or a conviction, a court. But these are facts that need to be known at the front end. And that is precisely what Judge Teske is doing. His, his substantive approach is, is about that. It's about let's know these kids. Let's have the juvenile courts know these kids. Let's have the school counselors know these kids. What are they going through? What are they suffering outside of the school? And that's largely the problem with zero tolerance is zero tolerance doesn't care. It doesn't matter. And that's the same thing with SB 440. It, we don't care about factual mitigating circumstances under those laws. There's no discretion. Okay. But now as we see the erosion, as we see zero tolerance policies being pulled back, it's our responsibility our responsibility to understand, to know these children. Because there are some profoundly impactful things that happen to these kids outside of the classroom. I promise you that. And these facts need to be a part of the metric we use when imposing justice, whether that's at school, whether that's in juvenile court, whether that's in adult court. So it's, it's not so much a Ad, you know, a strategy as it is an advocacy tool or a responsibility of the people in the school system to do so. Uh, because learning this information and presenting this information can in fact be the difference between a child who maintains the structure of school or a child who is, is washed away and, and cannot get out of, of, of a system. And I'll leave you I'll leave you with this. It's a client's story that I, that I often, often use. Uh, he was 13 at the time he committed an armed robbery. He was a tag along with two older kids. He didn't have a gun and he never actually took anything, but culpable, responsible party to an armed robbery. He was in foster care at the time he was two. From the time he was two to 13, he was in 30 different placements, 30 different placements. Over 30, as well, over 30 different separate instances that we could find from his, from his records where he was removed from school. So at the time he's 13, this is all leading up to the time he's 13, he commits this armed robbery. He, under SB 440, because it's an armed robbery, is treated in our adult court and he receives a sentence of 40 years, 40 years. He is about 14 years into that sentence now. And 
in representing him and, and, and going back and, and looking through all his, his records, uh, we came across some incredibly interesting psychological issues. <laughs> but I think the most impactful and the thing that touches people the most is that at the time he, was, he committed his armed robbery, he was actually taking bedwetting medication. So he was still wetting the bed right, like a small child at the time he commit this, committed this armed robbery. And we sentenced him to 40 years. And there's a distinct possibility that despite our efforts, which have been going forward for close to four years now, that he'll serve those 40 years or a good portion of those 40 years. No one, not, not anyone, ever took the time to ask Chris, and that's his name, anything about himself. He was simply flushed through our system, no, lost the structure, never had any family, never had anyone to advocate for him, and he's grown up in our prisons. And there's many, many kids like him. There's many, many kids in, in, our, in our prisons like Chris. So the importance of taking the time to learn facts about these kids is incredibly important. Without an entire or systemic change, even doing that, even taking on the responsibility of learning these things about these kids can, can, can make a big difference. But I think that's precisely what Judge Teske and, this, and these new inward-looking models of, of discipline are, are, are trying to do. Who are these kids? Who are these kids? They're not monsters that end up going to, into our prisons, although that's what we like to call them. You know, they, they're kids, and we need to know about them. And I am available um, at sreba at emory.edu. That's S-R-E-B-A at emory, E-M-O-R-Y dot E-D-U. Um, if you have a question, if you have perhaps a client that you think needs representation, please, please give me a call and we'll be happy, happy to help out. Thank you.